But ultimately, it comes down to people. People process technology in that order. The velocity of information, the velocity of technology is at an all-time high. How do you stay in front of the wave, Tracy, and be able to surf the wave and keep yourself in a position of winning, aka providing products, programs, creativity, knowledge, and experience? Hey, welcome back to the Real Estate Excellence Podcast. This is your host, Tracy Hayes. And today I have a very special individual. He's probably one of the most experienced leaders in the mortgage industry here in Northeast Florida, if not Florida as a whole, probably even the Southeast. Anyone has put 35 years in the mortgage business, he's, he's a tough man. So he's put up with a lot. But we're going to learn a little bit about Tom Reber with Cross Country Mortgage. He's one of the very influential in the Mortgage Bankers Association here, not only locally, but nationally as well. And we're going to hear about that. Tom, welcome to the show. Well, thank you, Tracy. I appreciate uh, you coming today and being a part of what I do. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. I, I do not have my notes here in front of me because we're, we are working mobile today yes. in Tom's office. He's his beautiful background behind him there as well. But Tom, I, I like to start off every show. Where are you from? Well, I, Where'd was, you grow? I was born in Albany, Georgia, but I grew up here in Jacksonville, Florida. Lived here 53 of my 55 years. And in the, in the mortgage space, I've been doing it, like you said, a long time. And I had about eight years in national accounts. So I've been to every major city in the United States. Awesome. Cut my teeth, learning from other extremely top producers, real estate companies, getting a nice uh, I, are you a florida grad I, I, I you don't have any of this on your linkedin no, no so you, i i would education's uh, no longer important <laughs> well when you get the scars and tattoos and uh, the, the street cred of of doing the job for as long as i have but i went to st john's river community college oh okay. actually specialized in playing baseball i went to unf for a hot minute and got into hey i need a job you know i did not realize that in st john's river they they've got a new coach over there or at least for the last few years anyway yes. And from what I understand, they're putting together a pretty good ball club. And uh, I have some inside information because a friend of mine is involved with Major League Baseball scouting. Yes. And uh, he plans to be up here quite a bit. There's a few ball players on that team right now. Without a doubt. St. John's State College now is what it's called. Mm -hmm. I was there at St. John's River Community College. Uh, Ross Jones. I played with his brother. And uh, he was a pitcher on our team back in the late 80s. Awesome. And uh, Ross was actually a pro player at that time. He was a pitcher. And uh, he's taken that program to higher levels that uh, I played golf uh, last year at Palatka, I would call a country club, the municipal course down in Palatka <laughs> for a fundraising event. Went by the went by the field and I was blown away. But they went to the college, junior college World Series this year. They got knocked out, but they went. They were in over in uh, Arizona. Uh, first time ever, which is tip my cap to the, the yeah. Vikings and great job. Yeah. I'm, I'm looking forward to when my friend of mine and I graduated from high school comes up to scout those guys, go down and see them and go watch a few games for sure. So you graduate from the Army. Uh, was finance, what was your major? What did you? My, like I said, my major is pretty much baseball. Major whatever will get me by. <laughs> I, wanted, I wanted to play further. I wanted to aspire to be a pro player. I thought right. I was pretty good back in the day. Came back home and was trying to figure it out and pretty much was voluntold to go get a job. And uh, back then parents were like, hey, you can get a job, but you're not going to stay here. And, I got a job working at uh, Stockton, Watley, and Davin slash Bank Boston Mortgage Corporation as the computer operator. Work at midnight in the morning. So back then, computers were, it took two or three floors of computers to do what your smartphone can do today. Right. And so all the jobs that were submitted during the day were run at night, along with the printing of the, the paper, the checks, all that stuff that was done. So I worked on that from midnight to eight in the morning. Then eight o'clock in the morning, I took all the reports around and I learned the mortgage business by delivering reports at the very beginning, back in 89. Wow. And I played on a corporate softball team. And I went from 165 pounds of, of, of ball player muscle and went down to about 155 because I'm not wired to work all night and not sleep all day because I'm a, I like to sleep at night. <laughs> right. So anyway, bottom line is playing on the softball team as well as a men's travel team called the Jacksonville Vikings. The softball team was winning and I went to him and I said, hey guys, I can't do this job anymore. And I was voluntold to, hey, you need to become a loan officer due to the fact that you're not quitting the softball team because we're winning. I'm like, great. <laughs> what does that do? And they're like, well, you finance houses. And I'm like, I guess I could do that. Sounds like a plan. 
So immediately I went from the softball field, went to the interview they lined up for me and, uh, and Andy Wetzel, I love Andy Wetzel, who is the branch manager of Bank Boston Mortgage Corporation, looked at me and said, yeah, we're not hiring. Why does that name, why does that name sound so familiar? He was the branch manager back in the late 80s to the early 90s at Bank Boston Mortgage Corporation, SWD, Bank Boston, Andy Wetzel. Now he's a, a bank president in Tennessee. I don't know exactly okay. where. But uh, Andy, Andre Brooks, a uh, name you may remember, uh, worked with Tom Callahan, Gary Royals, Scott Warren, Kelly O'Brien a long time ago. Uh, all those guys, all those mortgage athletes, we had a phenomenal team, mm -hmm. probably about a 6% market share in this market. And uh, anyway, when I met with Andy and said, Andy, they want me to be a loan officer. He goes, 21 years old and you're a hot shot. I'm not hired. <laughs> I go to the softball game that night and I said, hey, guys, probably my last game because I'm out. I can't work nights anymore. I'm dying. And they all looked at me and goes, uh, Andy didn't get the message. Right. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> so I go back in Andy's office the next morning and he's like, congratulations, I'm going to hire you. I'm pretty much going to fire you in six months. <laughs> so anyway, fast forward. Six months. To, <laughs> six months. Well, in that six months, probably two weeks into it. Right. Cecilia Faircloss was the, was the receptionist at the, the office. Yeah, I have to say one of the great things about you, and because that's one of my weaknesses, you remember names. You're rattling off names from 30 uh, plus years ago. The DNA of what, uh, how I got here, I forget nobody <laughs> because there's so many people that have enabled me to get where I am today. And the, the names that I mentioned, there's still a lot of people in the business. Right. And so anyway, Cecilia, who I walked in, I was two weeks into it. Andy goes on vacation and I said, Cecilia, I'm going to go make sales calls. She says, no way. You're not making sales calls. I said, well, I can't read this book anymore. There are three big binders, FHA. <laughs> <laughs> like you're supposed to memorize the guidelines exactly right? <laughs> so wait i go out and make sales calls to watson west side i mm -hmm. grew up on thumper street on the west side in cedar hills and i used to go to the watson office to get my birth certificate notarized to play little league baseball and i walked in there and with my suit on and i said hi good to see you courtney ray walks out and says tommy reaver what are you doing here i said well mr ray i am a i'm a loan officer and he said no you're not Get in my office. So I go in there and I sit down with Courtney and I, he goes through and goes, you really a loan officer with Bank Boston Mortgage Corporation? They would hire you? I said, well, I look good in my suit, don't I? He goes, well, you, you look good, but can you make a loan? And I said, well, Courtney, I'm not sure, but I'm out making sales calls today. So anyway, as I'm sitting there, you sit, Gilberstadt walks in, says, Tommy Reaper, what are you doing here? I said, hey, Miss Gilberstadt, how are you? I went to high school with daughter. Mm -hmm. She said, when you're done with Mr. Ray, Get your fanny in my office. I need to talk to you about some mortgage stuff. I'm like, there's a win. Right. Literally two minutes later, Maxine Kelly walks in and says, Tommy Reaver, what the heck are you doing here? And I said, hey, Miss Kelly, how are you? How's your, how's Stephanie doing? <laughs> she looks at me. She says, don't leave without talking. Courtney's eyes are getting the biggest silver dollars. She's like, hey, don't you know in my office? Literally, Mary Cook walks in. You just, all, all these agents that I had really knew that I knew. We're in the real estate business and walked in the office at one time or another. I walked out. I go out of the office with two contracts in hand. I get in my little pickup truck and I said, I am bringing home the bacon. I get in there. <laughs> I, go, I go all the way back over to Bay Meadows Way and I come in like a NASCAR winner. I bring the contracts to the processing team and I drop them on Vicki Walker's desk and Susan Davis's desk and sit down there. And I said, congratulations, ladies. I got more where that come from. And they're like. So the perception initially. Is that you're just, you're young. You don't even yep. own your own home. Yep. You don't even know what a mortgage is. Don't know it. And, and I mean, did they feel you could not represent or just because you maybe you didn't know enough people to approach them? What was the, what was that so, initial? They, so on the softball team, we had two loan officers and those loan officers, you know, and being a loan officer, prestigious position. Mm -hmm. And uh, I played shortstop for the team, the head of, uh, IT at the time was our pitcher. We had two or three executives come to the games. And they were playing the attorney slash accountants league. And they had won a game in a couple of years. <laughs> when I stepped in there, <laughs> asked me to play on a softball team as part of the, in the jobs. They said, hey, captain of the baseball team, we play softball. Here. Yeah. <laughs> Next thing you know, they, uh, they start winning. Right. And we win our division. And then that's about that time. I'm like, hey, I got to go. I'm dying. Right. And they're like, no, we kind of like the taste of winning. <laughs> that's how I got into the mortgage space. <laughs> 
And, but Andy looked at me and he looked at me and said, Tom, I I fall in love with you, but you don't have any experience, knowledge, background about mortgages. You haven't even owned a home before. Right. And I just said, well, Andy, I need a job and I'm hungry. Right. And he looked at me and he said, no, I go back the next day. And he's red faced and said, oh, well, I'm going to hire you Mm -hmm. and I'm going to fire you six months. When I came, when he went off to vacation, I had two contracts in hand. I walked back to that office. So he goes, holy cow, where did you get those? And I said, well, I collected two contracts. That's what I was supposed to do. I walked back to the operator, the processing team. I put the two contracts down on Vicki Walker's desk, who's still a dear friend of mine today. And I put them on her desk and she looked at me and she goes, what do you think I'm going to do with those? And I said, well, Vicki, I'm going to go get more of those because that's what I do is I collect contracts. So I turn away to walk away and it's just dead silence. I stopped. It's a little too quiet. I turned back around. They're all looking at me. Susie Kaysen was like, who do you think you are? And I said, I'm Tom Reaver. I'm a loan originator. I'm going to get more contracts so we can originate more loans around here. Right. And they looked at me and they said, good luck with that. I go back out. I make, a, I make start making sales calls on 103rd Street. I meet Robert Woods from, at that time, Shell Real Estate. And then uh, Jimmy Farhead at Century 21. Uh, I come back with another contract. I slide in, I have another contract. So Faircloth looks at me and says, Tom, you realize you're the top producer today. <laughs> and I'm like, what does that mean? She goes, two days, three contracts. Mm-hmm. Let me know how it goes in the back room. Back in back in this time period that you're talking about, because I'm, you know, I'm graduating high school, going yeah. into college myself, and few, just a few years behind you. The, pers- the business, the real estate business at that time, you know, as I tell a lot of these, I'm these lot of sub 30 real estate agents yep. right now that are really doing great. Back then it was the real estate agent was typically the spouse of somebody who was the president of the bank or whatever. And That's she right. tinkered over here in real estate. That's right. And in the mortgage side, I've never discussed this on the podcast ever yep. on the mortgage side, they thought, you know, writing a loan was, I guess, a rocket science. So you had to be, you know, special to write a loan. When really is just having great, got great mentors, you know, people behind you that's supporting you. But the key point, and one of the things I wanted to get into you with, you had obviously, you know, went to college, your people knew you, you walked in, you immediately, they, you obviously had some influence and credit, you had some credibility. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, and they didn't look at you, even though you were 21 years old, they didn't go, yeah. oh, he's this 21 year old brat kid that was playing yeah. on ball. You had earned some credibility with them that they were willing to, knowing this was oh, your first deal. That, it was incredible. What Courtney Ray gave me the endorsement sitting in his office. That was a big one. And the reason I got that is I literally rode my bicycle to the Watson Real Estate Office and brought my birth certificate in to get it notarized so I could play Little League Baseball. <laughs> Courtney Ray. <laughs> Good did I know that a lot of these people I went to high school with, their mothers were real estate agents. I didn't realize that you said Gilmer Stapp was working at Watson Real Estate down the street on Blandick Boulevard. When I walked in, sat down in my blue suit, they looked, walked by and did a double take and said, hey, what are you doing here? And I'm like, well, I'm a loan officer at Bank Boston Corporation. Come see. I Because they've money. known you a dozen well, years at this point. Well, you six, seven years mm-hmm. of high school, going to events and things like that. And, mm-hmm. you know, Confederate Point was the cat's meow on the west side of a neighborhood. And a lot of them lived in there. Mm-hmm. And I, like I said, it was, was, if you're willing to go make sales calls and make a relationship, it's no different than today. There's a better than good chance you're going to make a connection. And so learning early on to say, hello, I'm Tom Reaver is usually the can opener opportunity. And then what I've crafted over the many, many years is how to be an interview. People ask me what I do for a living. I say, I interview people. What's your name? What's your sign? Where are you from? Simple. So I say, let's talk about what are you looking for? How are you going to get there? And what can I do to help you get there? And all of them come back and say, tell me more about what you do. Well, great. Before we do, tell me what you got going. And the next day, you know, it's a dialogue of meaningful conversation. And and it started back in the late 80s. The, we use the term relationship a lot. Yes. I use it with, you know, if you listen to any of my episodes with the real estate agents, it's relationship, relationship. We continue to use it, but we don't really, I think a lot of people who are listening or people outside the industry, or even some people maybe aren't as successful in our industry don't can't really define it because it is a lot of it's you know are you clicking because you play softball together is that why you mesh or you went to high school or went to high school with one of the that's you know all of a sudden your your the door is open a little bit for you because you've got some credibility they've known you for six or seven years basically saw you grow up 
and earn that. In the loan officers today that you're working with, because things haven't changed. Not, it's still, not much. you know, you and I have talked about this in yeah. depth offline about, you know, how to build these relationships. As we know, our realtor friends, unfortunately, you know, if we, you know, foul one off occasionally, you know, they, they're looking for a pinch hitter, you know, yeah. often not only to find out that they're, that person's going to foul one off too. <laughs> you know, I, I th- to your point, the relationship comes down. Are you willing to be there when times aren't so good? Mm-hmm. Everybody thinks it's easy. And we've touched on this and I'll, I'll kind of hammer this point home. Are you a maker? Or are you a taker? So people who take transactions are what I call people who hit singles and hope they get enough singles to score a run, right? If you're a transaction maker, which basically means you help them organically find ways, whether it's total cash benefit analysis, whether it's looking at and going through the credit report with the customer, helping them understand how to be optimized on what they're doing. Uh, not from a credit point or credit score perspective only, from a cash flow perspective. How do we take that? Which is actually what you need to do today when rates are higher. You can still do a blended average on that. Mm-hmm. But at the end of the day is what are you doing when things aren't so good? When realtors are, hey, uh, Tom, I got to make this happen. How do we get this? How do we make sure that we capture? That's relationship selling. Total cost benefit analysis is a part of that. But the relationship piece is, is how do we help transactions have a higher percentage of seed for the right reason? Buyers and sellers. Well, let's let's take that in well, two different times. I mean, obviously we know seven, eight, nine, and the ten was a was a tough time. Successfully real estate agents learned to learned how to do those short sales. Yeah. And, you know, yeah. they're obviously as two thousand eight came around, if I remember going get my dates correct, yeah, in late two thousand eight, the rates started to drop. So That's you and I business came in because we were doing a lot of refis. That's right. And that standpoint. But from the standpoint of helping the agent and then take it to today, you know, we got a shortage of inventory. I've talked to many mortgage loan officers, you know, basically the last year or so has been the worst year that they've had. And, you know, for, for guys that have been in it a decade or more, you know, there, there's real estate agents, obviously they're rolling out. So what are some of the, what are some of the things that you've done you've learned over the way to get creative in helping the agent, as you were just mentioning? So I like to say that we do a buyer consultation. So people, hey, hey, go get pre-approved. We're going to do a little bit more than get pre-approved. I'm going to, I'm going to have a conversation. With you. Let's look at the four corners of the transaction, income, asset, credit. We have to galvanize the first triangle before we can bring the fourth leg of the stool in, which is the collateral. You need to understand how, why, and do you have the ability to repay? When you bring in those three pieces, you can bring the collateral in with confidence. However, game plan is in place. It also comes with a little bit more additional collaboration with your real estate agent park to say, hey, here's the prescription. Here's the high watermark. Let's fit what we can. And we have to have a plan because another phrase that I've kind of coined, Tracy, is hurry up and wait, hurry up and close. If you want to sit around and hope the game's going to, the deals are going to, you're going to miss. You have to be in position. You have to be ready and you have to be ready to strike. So the buyer consultation up front to get the collaboration between the actual home buyers and their agent on the same page is critical and financing sells houses and it's a cash flow analysis game. And most people come in and a lot of them have a preset mindset of Ooh, the rates are bad or my payment. Understand I can work on all those. This is a cash flow game, not just a payment game. How do we take and optimize your whole cash flow analysis to put you into this house, even though you may have a 7% rate or a 6% rate? And how do you have your blended average go from, hey, my outgo was $4,000 a month that I bought a new house and my outgo went down to $2,800 a month. He saved me $1,200. Holy cow. Who cares about the rate in theory? Because my cash flow analysis just went down $1,200. I still bought a new house. I was able to upgrade for the right reasons. That's total cash benefit analysis. And I would, I, I know the standard loan officer out there, you know, a lot of times these, these agents are, you know, 11th hour. <clears throat> They're getting their pre-qualification. Hopefully, yeah. maybe we do get a couple of weeks right now because it did slow down with the inventory. That's right. We are actually getting time to get those few days yeah. to actually get it approved by the underwriter Fast and so forth. But to to take this time with everyone, and then will is the customer always willing to sit there and listen? Uh, you know what you just explained to me. I'm like going, okay, they just bought a new house. Well, most likely, if they bought a new house in the lat and didn't truly like go downscale from a $500,000 house to a $250,000 house because the rates went up, their outlay is going to be a lot more. 
explain a little bit more in detail what you're talking about, or maybe give an example, maybe so, one you've had recently where you, where you went through this cash flow analysis. So a lot of folks said, they buy their box one house, three mm -hmm. bedroom, two bath, they buy it for 250,000. Now it's worth, let's say 350 or 400,000 in five years. Mm -hmm. So they have all this pixie dust in this house, but they have a 2.75% interest rate, two car payments, two credit cards. All of a sudden, they've lived to their means. Now, they are what we call a move-up buyer for the right reasons. They sell this house, which is a starter home for somebody else, to go get a slightly move-up house, take the pixie dust out of house, house A. Let's just say it's $175,000 equity they get out. Mm -hmm. They've lived in for almost you know, three or four years, whatever the number is. They then come over here and they buy this house. Well, it's much easier to homogenize the 30-year fixed payment because the difference between $50,000 either way is not a heck of a lot of money compared to a $500 car payment, a $650 car payment, another $300. Are you, are you are you big on paying off cars? I mean, I mean, the refinance times, I you know, it's always a challenge. Do you, do you pay off the car? I mean. My vote is if you can get rid of the car, get rid of the car. Mm -hmm. Because when you look at the cash flow, let's just say you have monthly income of $6,500 a month. You pick up $500 a month off a car payment, off the, it, that just it's, it brings brings live right. to the cash flow analysis so they become much more comfortable. So when you spell out and give them the simple Fisher price approach of, hey, guess what? You didn't realize it, but you're already spending 50% of your income in that house. Take the powder out of this house, put it into this house, pay upgrade awesome your that. house, get the four bedroom, get the three bath, pay the the 500,000. So basically mm -hmm. in theory, you're going from a 250, which you're going to sell from 400 to a 500, which is a four three. And you're going to sit there and take 75000 of the 100000 wipe out the two cars, wipe out the two credit cards, and now you have a cash flow positive of significance. Why do you, I mean, you've experienced this. Yep. When I was in the call center doing a lot of refinances, especially, yep. you know, late 08, 09, yep. 10, 11, 12, why people have the psychological block of, of, you know, they're so worried about paying off this three four $400,000 debt when they're sitting, they are sitting on $20,000 in credit card debt. You know, they're not putting a down payment on the car. So their payments, you know, five, 600 or more. Well, that's a great point. And I think when you do the math with them, a lot of times you literally have to say, Hey, do you have a Fisher price calculator? Let's walk it through mm -hmm. money coming in, money going out. Are you better or worse by doing this? 99.9% .9 of the time they say I'm much better. We're clicking. Right. And this this is a transaction maker. Now you have the confidence. And I've, I say this a lot. If you don't have confidence and swagger, like sharks, they smell mm -hmm. it. They don't trust you. They're going to swim off. If you have confidence and swagger and you can back it up with stats, facts, and figures, have the glue that it takes to make it a collaborative, collaborative approach on a transaction. Right. So your real estate agents at comfort, they understand and your buyers are at comfort. They become very sticky and, and understanding. And I, and I say the word sticky because we're a team. This, this team, you can't turn a double play. You can't do a six, four, three double play without having the six, the four, and the three, right? Same thing in real estate. You got to have finance, real estate, and listing agent. They all have to collaborate together to win. Accounting, the other 14 players from closing agent, survey, or termite, home inspector, all those pieces have to collaborate together right. at the same time. Right. I'm going to change subjects, just to change angles just a little bit. You've been here for 40 plus years. That's right. In the area. You've seen the, the, the growth. You, where do you, where, and we're, and we're really, I don't even know if Jacksonville, if, if Jacksonville was considered full, I think we're, well, I say Jacksonville, the region. Yeah. The greater Jacksonville market area, we're probably at forty five percent. Yeah, if, if that. that, if that, yeah. We we have we're a small town with big riches. Mm -hmm. We're a small town even today. With the migration is real. We've got people coming from Chicago, D.C., New York, San Francisco, uh, Denver of all places are mm -hmm. all coming here. Thousands per month. It's crazy. We have plenty of places to grow. Obviously, the the north side. The 32034 Fernandina Beach, uh, the 202 connector and in, in, in Yuli go all the way down to the Blue Route, which is the Shands Bridge expansion. International Park Golf or International Golf Parkway is no longer in the middle of nowhere. It's mm. in between St. Augustine <laughs> and Jacksonville. And right. by the way, guess what? You got a Bucky's, you got a Costco. It's officially on the map. <laughs> Palencia is no longer in the middle of nowhere. Right. 
we have so much to go in the southern part of St. John's County that's going to continue to explode. What, what is your opinion on Hastings? I, I thought by now somebody would have done, especially when it came over and, you know, they had to go, the county took over. Uh, why that area? It's just time. Somebody, you know, I envisioned uh, a new villages. I do too. I do too. I think eventually when the blue route gets done and that Shans Bridge goes into a four-lane bridge, mm -hmm. you're going to have State Road 13 going south become extreme. It's just like everybody's talked about the 32043, which is Green Coast Springs and the, the evolutions where the old Reynolds aluminum plan, I think, used to be on the corner. That All that has been rezoned. That's all been done. That mm -hmm. is going to morph 100% in five years. So when this Blue Root Bridge gets done, I have a feeling State Road 13 South, as you go past Orangedale or, or Coley's Cove going south, mm -hmm. that's all going to start becoming really popular. And uh, Rivertown, the backside of Rivertown that everybody thought was in the middle of nowhere, becomes really popular. No, now, now the, the, the Publix is out there. Yeah. They've expanded the road all the way out there. Rivertown is is one of the hot spots. I think some people, you know, obviously five years ago, or when the first house is, people were like, man, that's way out there. Yeah. Or we were talking about King and Bear. Yeah. When King and Bear went in, it was out in the middle nowhere. nowhere. Yeah. Uh, now, now, now. There's it's still a cow pasture right next to it, but that's slowly being, half of it was just taken away. They're building something and I'm sure the other half will sell soon. That will happen. Well, we won't even recognize that place in 10 years or less. We yeah. won't even recognize it. Yeah. And, and I think going south, St. John's County still has a lot of bull run left in it and going south. And like you said, Hastings in that area, is, Elkton is untouched. I mean, it's untouched land. Yeah. Just and crossing to, over to Palatka, which oh, you mentioned earlier. You go through East Palatka the, and then Putnam County is probably, well, it, 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 from a stats, facts, and figure standpoint, it's probably the poorest county in the state, but it also has the highest upside with waterfront property all over the place. Mm -hmm. Bostwick on the east side, the west side, all that river is, is going to cycle. All right. So you're, you're running Reaver Mortgages. Yep. You're looking at this lay of this land. How would you, because, you know, and I asked this question because you've been in leadership for a long time. Yep. You've been managing teams over areas, yep. that kind of thing. Yeah. I know you got some solid guys that have followed you for a long time. Sure. There's supposed leaders out there that have worked for you. You've spun off other leadership. Yep. You're, you're given a clean slate and said, Tom, I want you to create Reber mortgages. How, tell us the breakdown. And, and I want to go, I want to go, you know, where would you geographically one question like, Hey, would you go out, to, you know, put offices in strategic locations? Do you have, what's your mindset on that? You know, next to real estate offices or whatever it might be. And then how would you structure Reber mortgages from the LO up to the CEO? I'm a firm believer over the many years, I believe everybody needs to have their hand on the electric fence. If you don't have your hand on the rope, pulling it in the right direction, you're probably not going to be a part of my team. Processing, underwriting, leadership, you have to have a taste every month of why and how you get there. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that I've told most everybody I work with, there's a reason why I keep my hand on the electric fence is because if I'm not connected to the electric fence, I'm disconnected. And a lot of leadership you have today, they've gotten really, really big and they become very uh, complacent. That's not. So I push organizations where I work to be mortgage excellence. And mortgage excellence is, hey, you don't make everything perfect. But if you have the hustle, the drive and commitment to win, more than likely you're going to provide mortgage excellence. So building a culture out with everybody saying, hey, it's difficult to get customers. It's precious to keep them. And we have to keep putting one foot in front of the other and strive for mortgage excellence every day. Because if you're not striving for mortgage excellence, then why are you here? You, know, you, you have to be in tune. That's why I say you have to have your hand on the road. Number two, location and where you go and how do you want to expand? Uh, I'm real bullish on Daytona. I'm bullish on St. Augustine. I'm bullish on North Florida, Jacksonville, of course, 904. And I like the Panhandle. That's, that's the sandbox that I like. I like the, the, the Eastern and Northern uh, corridor in Southeast Georgia of uh, where I'm at. I'm bullish in all of it. I know it. I live it. I play there. I work there. I live there. Simple as that. And when I look at what's next in the mortgage business, I see starting to see where are we going to be? You know, the velocity of money, the velocity of change, and with all the CFPB stuff that's going on and the, and the banking industry, who's going to be in this business to lend money? The good news is there's plenty of money. 
the, the, the bad news is, is, is it being a broker? Is it being an actual mortgage banker with a bank? Or is this just to be a correspondent lender banker? Right. I will say this. There's no real right answer today on that because it's a cash flow game and you have to be able to make a margin to be able to survive. The structures that are in place today, we have three defined ones and then you have some hundreds. I think ultimately it comes down to people. People process technology in that order. The velocity of information, the velocity of technology is at an all-time high. How do you stay in front of the wave, Tracy, and be able to surf the wave and keep yourself in a position of winning? AKA providing products, programs, creativity, knowledge, and experience. That's a five tool athlete I just described. That's a five tool mortgage athlete. Today, you have to be a five tool mortgage athlete to really be able to participate and collaborate. There's a lot of people that are application takers that are, hey, check the box, sign here, go here. They turn it loose. Odds of that succeeding are 50 50. It's kind of give you the take. So that. if you were, and just I want to finish up that question and lead me into the, the next one. Would you strategically start looking, assuming money was not a, a true obstacle, to start placing people in those locations? You know, all those places we just mentioned, Hastings, Palatka, having people start working those areas. Because right now, there are people down there. Obviously, the banks have their people out of the branches that are working there, possibly. The talent but they're... is there. Mm -hmm. Needs to be, I'm not going to say the word trained. You know why? Because everybody who gets trained doesn't mean they're good. I'm a firm believer the aptitude of the ability of information equals winning. There's so many people that I always hear all the time say, they just need to be trained. If I have to train you, I have to fire you. <laughs> that means you're not getting out of your own way to get the job done. So there's a lot of folks that come to me and say, hey, Tom, I want this, 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 and this. And I say, it's one, two, six, 12. That's at least 24 man hours of training you on the hope that you can get out of your own way. Inspire me to want to train. Make me want to be part of your success. Hey folks, this episode was produced by Streamline Media, the number one media company for helping brands generate content that converts. I knew I wanted to start a podcast to reach more people and bring value to the world, but I did not have the time or the knowledge. Streamline Media became my secret weapon to building my show. They handle all my backend work, production and strategies to keep my show going strong. If you're in the real estate business and looking to make content that generates more leads and brings in more revenue, check out the Streamline Media link in the show notes and discover how partnering up can supercharge your path to real estate excellence. Would you agree or disagree with this statement? Because uh, I'm going to tell you what I, I personally believe uh, from what I've seen. Some of these, especially the larger lenders, have spent so much time and energy on technology, which is important, but you don't necessarily have to be the leader. You don't necessarily have to be the first one to have that. And they've taken, really taken away those, the resources in giving people like yourself the time to mentor and, and you know, groom some of those potential mortgage athletes, as you like to say. To that point, in this order, people process technology this way gets you the synergy mm -hmm. if you go technology first you devalue the people and you hope the process works if you go process first technology second people third well you have no control yeah nobody's in it to win it so all of a sudden you have no accountability so as long as the person's at the front of the spear the the, 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 stem, the middle part is strong based on the support and enhancements of the technology now you can go in and make it happen. And I believe it. People, process, technology, and that order equals a synergy of success. And keep it in that order. And that's why I call it a wave. You have to be in front of the wave, navigating the wave. Because when you're in the turbulence, guess what? You're not in control. But if you're in front of the wave, you can go where you need to go because you're in front of the wave. You have people supported by the process, enhanced by the technology. And guess what? The velocity of the support and the enhancements of technology today are moving at the speed of business, which is fast. Well, I think uh, some of these institutions that we know, I worked for one for a long time that really did put their people first because your people will tell you what technology you need versus trying to spend all this time in research and development in technology that your people don't see value in. Let me ask you this Have question. no time for. Most powerful three-letter word in our language. Why?
Why? Yeah. Why? why? Keep your hand on the electric fence. That's why leadership has to be in tune. That's why I said a flat management curve. When you have this steep management curve where you have two or three layers to, to get to marketing and marketing gets sold by some company out of 10 buck two saying, hey, buy this can thing that's going to solve all your problems. Well, more than likely, the person is not where the field's going to say, I love that. It does so many things. That has all these sparkles. It doesn't work for the field. And the field never used it. Right. So you just wasted millions of dollars to have a connection to something that provides little or no value. You have to have weapons of mass loan production. And the people, to, you, to your point, Tracy, that can give you that is the people that do the job. Right. Right. 100%. You, go, you, you, have, you have to go. That's why a flat management curve gets you the connectivity the velocity of actual knowledge and experience to the leadership has to be this close because the more disconnected you are than you think you know, because people that are in those positions typically surround themselves with people that tell them what they want to hear. I'm the tallest midget because I check the most boxes and matrices. Right. Great. <laughs> but that doesn't get us any more business. Right. How do we get more repeatable, scalable business? We want to invest into those traits mm -hmm. because those pieces will then bring lift, which is foundation, repeatable, scalable. So you don't have the, the up and down of the business. Right. You have more of a steady way. So you going into that, you've been in the business several decades. Yep. Uh, you've been through some highs and highs and lows. You've seen, you know, from the time where you know, there was no technology. <laughs> no laptops. Uh, yeah. Yeah. To now where there's, but. You know, I think we, we, I don't hear it as much now, but we did hear it probably, you know, anywhere in the last, in last decade, how obviously the real estate agent was going to be replaced by, you know, Zillow, for yep, example, yep, yep. you know, the loan officer. Yeah. The, 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 I mean, people can do a lot online and technology yep. is there, but I mean, do you ever see a time when either one it can, is eliminated? I, I, cause I just don't see it. Well, I, I would tend to agree with you. You have to provide influence and value to earn your fee. Mortgage originators, you get paid a fee for your service. If you're not providing influence and value, replace it, right? So the, the, the fee for value, the fee for service is what type of influence and value to provide to the transaction and you can command a fee and get paid. Real estate agents today are the, the true pros that do this for, um, they're really good. Actually go and market. They actually kind of door knock. They actually do events. Uh, to get to know who they're doing business with. because mm -hmm. when people hand you the keys to sell their house, it's a responsibility to do it right. Uh, yes, there's brands. Yes, there's technology. But at the end of the day, people process technology. I always go back to that. And mm -hmm. it starts with your real estate agent. Your real estate agent professional, that's a real estate professional, uh, hooks up with a mortgage professional. And these athletes coming together can do the 643 double. That's the collaboration of the Deep thought there, because I, I, I feel, you know, we, you and I have talked offline about this uh, quite a bit, the, the disconnection of, of the, of the people in the process Yeah, that the companies up there, they want to produce, they, they think they're, they want to, it's like I, I, when I talk to the real estate agents and the reason why I'm stuttering, cause I'm thinking through deeply cause Tom's given some really deep thoughts here, the real estate agents are sold by their brokerages. Oh, I've got all this technology sure. and training. But like, but like you said, training is not really a great word. But if I ask every one of the real estate agents, they'll tell me every broker they work for, they went there because they have great technology. And, you know, I, I can name some big brokers yeah. that have been promising the world for years. We've yet to see this, you know, takeover of their technology because they, I feel they've, they've taken away from their people. They keep their, their, where the real estate, you know, we were, I was dealing with a transaction with my wife this uh, weekend. They're you know, obviously hearing her telling the stories. Yeah, the computer can be manipulated. You know, they can go in there. Oh, I got the cash, blah, 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 blah. Okay, take it off the market is what the computer would do. Yeah. You know, oh, we got an offer, yeah. cash, take it off the market. And then, you know, the, the, the timing and the process, the sense of urgency and the things that obviously, you know, you know technology helps us keep up with the sense of urgency. But when you first started, there probably was a little bit of a little more time gap. Yeah. You know, I need that I need that pre qualification. Okay, come by the office. I'll yeah. take your application. And you were doing it by hand, you know. And now it's like, okay, here, you know, click on my link, boom, I'll have it in ten minutes, have all your information, I'll have your credit report, boom, all like that. Yeah. You know. So you reminded me of uh, a question that was asked about three or four months ago in an interview. They asked me what was the number one change in your 
30 plus years business. And I said, the velocity of information, the velocity of information from your smartphone, which I call a dumb phone, but from your smartphone and all the advertising information out there, 97% of it is steering you, guiding you to a spot or a location. Doesn't mean it's right. And so the stock of the mortgage professional, the stock of the real estate professional today in 2023 is an all-time high because your influence and value, your need of information and experience is at an all-time high. So I look at your abilities as a mortgage professional and your abilities as a real estate professional is at an all-time high. So your stock is high, your value is high. This is where the, the law of the jungle is in place. The people who will provide the highest levels of influence and value will thrive. The people that can't, won't. And that's the law of the jungle. And so you've always heard the rule, 20% of the business, 80% of the business is by 20% of the business and 80% of the business is only 20% of the business. That's fact. That's the law of the jungle. Mm -hmm. Right now is on the law of the jungle is in full effect. And I think the, the people that are going to thrive have the aptitude and ability to utilize the tools in their toolbox, aka technology, all the bells and whistles, effectively. It's great to have all the tools in the toolbox, but you never get this, never get a different tool, then who cares? Right. You can have 150 tools in the toolbox, but if you use the same screwdriver every time, well, you can only do that one screw. Right. Congratulations, you're in a rut. Yeah. I mean, talking to different lenders and, and in my ex inexperience friends, for instance, using the CRM, you know, uh, if all the agents I talk to, same situation, all of us have our circle of influences sure. and so forth. But if you're, if, if there's any technology, I mean, to, to me, the CRM is probably, you know, the basic tool, right? It's, it is the, it is the having the basic Phillips head, flathead, you yeah. know, and your basic wrenches, yep. that's yep. your, that's your CRM. But we're so many of our, our lending friends are, are trying to go so much more <clears throat> high level that they're missing the, the basics and the loan officers aren't even using their own CRM, let alone the real estate agents. Now, the ones that are using it effectively are showing it, but they're, it, sometimes you, you got to keep it simple, stupid, right? You yeah. got to keep it basics and some of those basic things. And if your people aren't using it, then you're not effectively, you know, leveraging your people without leveraging doubt. your tools. Without a doubt. Technology can bring you mass confusion. Mm-hmm. How you use technology to bring clarity is what separates the successful from the people that are walking in circles. Yes. You can drink water out of the fire hose and never quench your thirst. How do you get, if it's just solid value, you're going to be super successful. As you learn how to become more engaged with the collaboration, remember, it's real simple. Income, asset, credit brings you the collateral. Well, you learn the story through the interview process at the beginning to be able to have a prescription for all parties. Hey, here's our plan. I'm QB1. I'm going to help you get over the goal line. This is how we're going to do it. Real estate agent says, ready, break, let's go. We have a plan. We know we are. That's how we right. get there. I want to finish up with this. I know you were looking at your watch there. So I assume you, yeah. you have another. <laughs> people, people want Tommy Tommy. <laughs> <laughs> You've been in leadership for a couple of decades, yeah. you know, based on I'm looking at your, your LinkedIn. What is the difference between, you know, some of those people in the late 2000s? versus the people you're managing today? The difference is the people that are I'm managing today are Swiss Army knives, okay? They know how to navigate to make a transaction. The ones in the late 2000s were what I like to say, conveyor belts to platforms. Okay, Tracy, tell me how you're gonna get your business. Well, I'm not sure. Great, you know what we're gonna do? You're gonna do FHA streamlining refinances. Here's your sandbox to go find. What about you? We're going to do VA interest rate reduction loans. We're going to do Harper Valley PT loan, PTA loans. But the strength, the muscle can go out there and organically generate the business because purchase transactions, resale, potentially builder side is organic growth that's just foundational. When you have a single conveyor belt, I'll, I'll leave you with probably the thing that sticks with you most is if you're a one trick pony or your income sphere is only a, is one piece. You're as good as that one piece. When you become two, become basically a fork. You can pick up more things because you got two channels of opportunity. When you do three, you become a trident. That is the minimum ticket to get to the show is have three business models to feed the sphere of success. It's called the trident approach. Anything more than a trident becomes a pitchfork and a rake and as big as you want to go. But if you don't have three, don't expect to weather storms. 
Give me an example of a Trident approach. Financial advisors, real estate agents, accountants. Let's throw in divorce attorneys. Let's throw in builders. Let's throw in insurance agents. Go on. So if you're, you have a new loan officer coming in today, 21 year old Tommy, mm-hmm. <laughs> fresh, I'd be gone. Sorry, yeah. sorry, Tommy can't hurry. Fresh, <laughs> fresh from hitting his home run last yeah. night in the softball game. Yes. What, what, how are, how are you, you know, what, what's some of the initial things you're going to have that person do? I mean, let alone learn what a mortgage is. I think we're, we take that, that they need to obviously know what that is. And there's training modules that you can sit down there. Or if you're a large enough organization, they'll have a physical training class. But you've got this fresh guy knows what a mortgage is. No, he knows knows enough to to write the basic stuff. What are what are you telling him how to run his business right now, or coaching him on? So, or her? They're so dumb. They're brilliant. They're so dumb. They're brilliant. They don't know what they don't know. They don't have. I'm so sorry. I can't do. That. How bad? How bad do you want to succeed? In this? That right there. If I don't feel the energy and inspiration that hey, I'm in it to win it, that's a problem. Because if I have to train, you have to fire you. I have to have you wanting to find how to do the job because then training becomes easy. You're hungry and you get a taste and you get an opportunity. I hired my last person that I hired that was probably six years ago that was in that realm. Being fresh, never wrote a mortgage before. Right. Mm -hmm. Six, they, they, they called on me for six months. It was my college roommate's son. And I looked at him and I said, no. No, no, no. You need to go pull more wire. You're not hungry. Come back two months later. Mr. Reber, I'd like to have a job. I said, no, I can't hire you. Six month mark, he comes to me and says, I quit my job. It's pulling wire. I have to have a job. We're now community. <laughs> you now have cut the umbilical cord and you now are hungry. You're right. now showing me. And guess what? Young man has become a top person because he had nowhere to turn to go forward. So one of the, one of the questions I had wrote down is like, what, what is the, what are some characteristics of, of some of the top loan officers you have or have had in, in the years? I guess having that hunger is one of them. You have to have an appetite and an empathetic appetite. You know, there's, there's, there's this appetite of just for ferocious ferocity. That's not going to work. You need to have an empathetic appetite. To become part of the fabric of the organization, the partners, things like that. So take a baseball team, for example. You know, you have a number seven hitter who's on the team. He doesn't hit it out of the park. Then they say, what do you need from him? He needs to do his job. He needs, if there's a runner on first, he runs to first. Because we're trying to move them running from first to second to third. And he wants to make action, put pressure on the defense. Know your role. Know your job. Understand how to get there. And you got to want to win just as much as the number one batter, the number three batter, the number four batter. The passion of the team has to gel to win. It takes that. So if you're a mortgage athlete looking to get into this business, you have to realize the game is much bigger than you and you're one piece of it. Do your best to inspire others to be better. You mentioned the, using the term team. And I, I'm, my vision is this is, it doesn't actually, it's not just the loan officer. No. It is the process. Yes. It is the underwriter. Yes. They've got to have that, that same mentality. You know, I always said the, the best underwriters were the ones like, you know, for those shaky loans, like this is not going to work. Can you, can you, do they have this? Do they have that? This is how we can, you know, spin this. And- Tracy, it's real simple. Precision origination. Take a good loan application. Get a good game plan in place. Mm-hmm. Precision origination. Proactive processing. You have to have a processor that's proactive. In solutionary underwriting, give me the answers to the quiz. We can get a one-time flyby. Let's clear it to close on the second time, second touch. Most people don't get cleared to close on the first touch. I get that. Give me the second touch, clear to close. That's good. That's, that's, that's velocity. That's moving at the speed of the business. I'm so sorry. We're cleared to close. We're still waiting for another two weeks to close. What? Who does that? That is exceeding the expectation. Another thing that I live by Tracy, and I have a, a wonderful assistant. She's amazing. Priscilla's amazing. I don't worry about anything. She's got my back. I have a processor named Brooke Burkhart. Do not worry about her either. And if, when I surround myself with people, you know, the number one trust thing I have is I don't trust. I don't have to have, uh, I have trust in them because they're doing things when I'm not looking. I don't have to micromanage. 
when you have to micromanage and all of a sudden you become, you're not confident that they're doing their job. What they're doing when I'm not looking or I'm not paying attention is spot on and they're exceeding the expectations to make us all look. Is that something you had to learn over the years? How long did it take you to, because, you know, obviously some of the people I listen to and I know exactly what you're talking about. I think some of these companies uh, are, are good at, it, or maybe you do get lucky uh, that you might, you have a, a good processor and underwriter, but I think a lot of the uh, companies miss the point that the loan officer is the point of the sword. They're out there. Correct. They, yeah. They do m probably make more than the other people in line because obviously if they don't bring in, they don't eat. If you can make it, you can bake it. That's a it, simple fact. Yeah. If, if, if it doesn't come in the door without a great mortgage athlete. Right. Correct. But then that's, that's just actually, I don't even know if that's even 50% of the game because I think you win with the referral partners and so forth by those on the people that don't aren't seen that's on right. a daily no, basis. There's no question. So when I, I attend my closings and today, I attend probably 90% of my closings. Mm -hmm. I take a selfie at those closings and I send it to my team saying, okay, one team, one goal. I copy the customer, I copy the agents and I copy my processor. I copy my assistant and I copy my closer. Mm -hmm. They all need a taste of what I call the Zen of the business. That The money doesn't buy that type of success and happiness. Because when you provide the opportunity to get the keys to the house and this whole transaction came together, there's a lot of celebration in place and you need to share it because most people behind the curtain don't get a taste of that. So right. I try to do my best as a leader to sit there and say, you are important, you are valuable, and this is the fruits of our labor. Thank you. Seal it. What do you think is, I said, we're coming up on 52 minutes here. We'll cut it off before an hour here, but. For for loan officers out there today, what do you what do you think is when looking at a, a company structure? Let's let's say you yeah. were looking out yeah. there. What do you think is the number one thing loan officers are looking for in well, their new? Back in the day, it used to be just hey, what's the highest compensation? Mm -hmm. the highest compensation of nothing is nothing, right? Mm -hmm. I think the blend of quality compensation, phenomenal support, because that's demanded, right? And mortgage excellence delivery is is demanded. It's just, it's a success. Products and programs, when you take all that information and put it together, it comes down to one thing, people. Because you can have all this wonderful stuff and you've got, you're not working with the right people and getting the right synergy. You're not delivering, you're not clicking. It doesn't matter. It's like compensation. If you make a 200 basis points and you close one loan a month, congratulations. You, you work really, really, really hard to get that one loan a month or you can find your velocity of production, which is, is it five loans? Is it 10 loans? Where do you fit? Can you do the 20 loans? Can you build a team? That, that's on you right. as, a, as, a, as a mortgage athlete to get there or a real estate athlete to get there. And that's kind of the new thing is, is building the team of trust that you don't worry about what they're doing when you're not looking. You know they're in it to win it and you don't waver from that. That is an acquired taste. And it's, a, it's, it's something that is a minimum standard to be a part of my world. So what I just heard from you in countering what obviously, you know, you know, follow Carl White and so forth, the mortgage market animals and, and what they're, sure. they're, the way he structures his business, because he is in that grow the team, you know, is, is, it comes down to who are the people? Because, you know, you could talk to many lenders. I can tell you, well, I have nine of these 10 programs. I have, n all of them have nine of 10 programs. There's something they don't do. There's nobody that has the whole book. Yeah. And then they, if they do have the whole book, they allow you to do it, but oh my God, to do it is like, but so, that's such a small percentage of loans that we do. So where you provide the influence and value tracing, your referral partner comes to you and says, hey, I have this. And you go, technical timeout. I don't have it. Guess what? You're my partner. I'm mm -hmm. going to find it. And I'm going to help shepherd. Who does that? That's a partner. Right. That's a partner. So if, if whether it's a lot loan or a, 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 some sort of commercial loan, you have to have a Rolodex of quality pieces to work with outside of your normal lane to be a total partner of your referral partner. And if you can do that, then it's a collaborative sell whether you're doing it or not. Yeah. And guess what? You get paid dividends by being a provider of opportunity to others and learn how to trade paint. And that's where Mortgage Bankers Association, pull the audience to a 50-50, phone a friend. You're on speed dial with me. You can call me. Hey, Tom, what do you think? 
I'll give you my advice. Right. Made always what everybody wants to hear, but you know what? I can sit there and give qualified advice to others. And I have probably about 10 people that are on my phone that call me from other places to say, hey, what do you think, Tom? And I'll say, here you go. This is your prescription that I would see, or maybe I can do it. Maybe this person can do it. You try to connect. If we went and took a half a dozen of your referral partners that have been with you for a while, what do you think? If we kind of asked them the same questions from a referral partner, what is it that, you know, if you, if you decide to retire today and they had to replace you, yeah. what, what would they be measuring other loan officers to what Tom delivers? So you know, what are, what are the deliverable that, that they love about? So one, I have 20 agents that are what I, what I call, they get Tommy time. They call, I pretty much stop what I'm doing. I answered the phone yesterday from the swim because when I'm calling. It's the phone. They're like, what's that noise? I said, I'm bobbing in the water. <laughs> and they're like, well, you could call me back. I said, what, what you got? And we talked about it for two or three minutes. I said, I'll call you back in an hour. You'll have it. Mm -hmm. Velocity of connection, having speed and connection to have valuable information to help collaborate. Most of my referral partners will tell you the extreme trust that I'm going to do the right thing for the customer, whether I'm doing the transaction or not. And then last but not least is confidence of delivery. But I say that's three because you're going to get all these together. But if you were to ask my, my let's say my top six, ten, top 10 agents, they'll tell you that Tom is part of the process. He's part of the fabric of our transactions. He is the go-to person to help start the fire. He's QB1. He's going to take the football. He's going to make an audible or he's going to give us the plan and make the play happen. And we're going to execute 97% of the time. The plan happens as designed, but we all know all of a sudden something changes. Inspection goes wrong. Appraisal value comes in low. Then how do you navigate from that? Usually he or she who sweats first loses. So you want to provide calmness and understanding the challenge and then help people overcome that challenge with the trust, with the confidence of what you're doing. And guess what? The other side feels that too. And they go, what can we do to help you get this deal done? I just had a conversation this morning. Tom, I'm here to help make the transaction. What can I do? And this is the other side, the listing agent. I said, exactly the person I want to talk to. Yeah. Thank you for being that yeah. way. And we collaborated. We found a way to make it work. So that's, that's and it'd be fun. I, I would love to talk to my referral partners that way. Have independent third party, you know, survey and say, <laughs> what do you like about Tom? What do you don't like about Tom? And I think ultimately at the end of the day, it's a trust thing. You just. Yeah. The agents that are experienced are understand stuff. Yeah. It's to, uh, we wouldn't have jobs if everything was going to go perfect every time. Perfect. You, yeah. you know, there's always something, a document, you know, however crazy it may be, but because they're doing that, they need the second W-2 and they come, you know, wh or whatever. That's an easy one. So here's but, one last piece. <clears throat> what you just said right there. Every objection is equal or greater opportunity for success. Mm -hmm. I love objections. Feed me your challenges. Feed me the ch what's going on difficult. We can fix it and overcome it for an even greater success. Yeah. So every objection is an equal or greater opportunity for success. 100%. And, and having that team behind you, because I've never, I never claim I know everything. I, I don't have, I don't, my mind can't know everything. It's just impossible. But again, having, like you have, you've mentioned multiple times to this interview, people yeah. and having that, you know, whether it's a teammate, a sales manager, an underwriter that you can reach out to and say, man, this one's a little squirrely. What do you think? Can we, you know, does this income going to work or whatever it might yeah. be? Yeah, and that's so, in, so in important in team. Tom, I appreciate it. Is there anything you want to add that I haven't asked here today? I mean, because uh, you and I, we could probably talk all, all afternoon. afternoon. <laughs> yeah. So I, I'm just going to say this. I'm thankful and grateful every day for my referral partners, the people I work with, my community, where I live, my family. My wife has been in this business with me for a long time. All three of my boys have all grown up in the mortgage space. They've all experienced what I like to say, the, the, the magic. I couldn't do it by myself. Mm -hmm. And as much as I'd like to think I'm a super person and Superman, I'm only as good as the people around me, people I work with. I've had Priscilla. I've got Brooke. I've got my other loan officers that I lean on because we all have a different secret, a secret weapon. Mm -hmm. And you got to learn how to use those secret weapons around you underwriters over the years, the companies I've worked with. But at the end of the day, I'm in my business to be my business. The people I work with and customers. That's it. Simple as that. I love that. So 
I'm proud every day. <laughs> Excellent way to finish. I appreciate you coming on. I love it. All Thank right, you, Tom. Tracy. All right. Cheers.